So, what is FM synthesis? Well, first, let's define modulation. And modulation basically means varying the properties of some periodic waveform, like the sine wave, uh, which is known as the carrier signal. And the properties are varied with another signal, the modulating signal. So the M in FM stands for modulation, and that's what it's about. FM synthesis, or frequency modulation synthesis, involves creating a sound by modulating the frequency of a waveform using another waveform. This technique was, I think, discovered by John Chowning in 1973, uh, probably actually uh, discovered by him in 1972, but first published in 73. In uh, the Journal of the Audio Engineering Society, a famous paper called The Synthesis of Complex Audio Spectra by Means of Frequency Modulation. Now, um, frequency modulation is FM radio, and it's been used since the early 1900s. Um, amplitude modulation was around at first, but they found better transmission uh, properties with FM radio. So it was already around before John sort of discovered how it could be used for sound synthesis. And uh, John Chowning was actually playing around with vibrato. Vibrato is periodically modulating um, frequency properties of uh, a signal, usually during performance. And he noticed that you can produce very interesting sounds if you allow the frequency of the vibrato how much modulation and how quickly it varies to be over extreme values. So we're going to look at uh, frequency modulation here and we start off just by considering a, um, a sinusoid. So that sinusoid will have some amplitude, A, which is not shown, um, and a frequency F Oh, I noticed several problems here. Probably best for me just to fix the slide right in front of you, so bear with me. So, it uh, reads a bit better now. So consider a sinusoid, it has three properties. It has an amplitude, frequency, and phase. Um, the amplitude just indicates how large that sine wave is. The frequency, how quickly it goes through one period of motion. So returned back to its maximum value from starting at its maximum value. Um, and the phase determines where, um, for a given time, where in its cycle it will be. So the, the instantaneous phase is actually a function of time and this initial phase phi. Any one of these three parameters can be varied, can be modulated. And so if you vary amplitude, you produce amplitude modulation. Vary frequency, it's frequency modulation and very phase, it's phase modulation. Now, frequency modulation and phase modulation are both a form of angle modulation, in that um, the sine wave, the angle of that, uh, that the sine is affecting, that angle is modulated either by varying the, fa the phase or varying the frequency. So, Although people talk about FM synthesis, most of the time people deal with phase modulation. And even most applications of frequency modulation, like FM radio, are more often uh, phase modulation. So we're going to do phase modulation. But you notice that um, the angle is varied by either frequency or phase. So these are very much related. And there's even a theory of how you can uh, render with the right choice of modulation, render frequency modulation to be identical to phase modulation and vice versa.
So, consider again our simple sine wave. Let's not worry about the amplitude of the sine wave because we just want to capture the basic property. This sine wave is going to be the carrier. So we'll refer to its frequency as the carrier frequency, F sub C. It's also known as the frequency offset because however much it's modulated is offset by this amount. And it gives a sort of fundamental frequency of the modulated signal. Um, so now let's go ahead and modulate that frequency with a different sinusoid. So we'll call this F. F of T equals D times the sine of 2 pi F sub M T. F sub M is the modulation frequency. So the modulator has its own frequency. D, the amplitude of this sine wave is the modulation depth, and it's important to consider the depth at this stage. So, um, we basically just take this modulator and use it as a, as a term to change the phase of the sine wave. So we have um, our new uh, modulated signal is x of t equals sine of omega c t, which is 2 pi fc. I'll, uh, I'll fix this again. Let me make it uh, a little, little nicer for you. Okay, so slides are fixed, and returning back to phase modulation, um, we do the modulation simply by adding in the carrier to uh, the signal. So, um, what we have is that the signal x of t is now replaced with x of t equals the sinusoid 2 pi carrier frequency times time, same as before, plus the modulator frequency. Put that in, and this is the result. How, what does this actually do? Let's uh, show a little example here. Here we have a fairly low frequency modulator and a higher frequency carrier. So the effect of this is that when the modulator is in, is close to its maximum value, is in the positive half of its cycle, the frequency of the carrier should be increased. When it's down close to its minimum, in the negative half of its cycle, the frequency should be decreased, and that means that the period is increased. And you can see this happening right here um, it becomes a much lower period, then it picks up pace until it's actually a slightly higher, a higher frequency than before. So, that's all very well and good, but how do we implement this? And we will implement this in the Web Audio API, and I will put online the uh, code, the JavaScript and HTML code for this implementation. So I'm just going to walk you through the implementation right now. So we have, let me make this big for you. We have two files, fmsynthesis.html and fmsynthesis.js. So one JavaScript, one HTML file. And here we are mainly putting the um, 
all the HTML and a little bit of JavaScript related to the user interface into the HTML file and we're going to put everything related to the web audio context and um, the focused not related to the interface JavaScript code into the JavaScript file. So we're going to put on the interface uh, one button to start and stop the audio and then controls for the parameters that have already been mentioned. Carrier frequency, modulation depth and modulation frequency. So to return back to the slides for a second. The parameters that we're interested in are the carrier frequency, the modulator frequency and the modulation depth. I've set ranges for each of these parameters right here and here and here um, and that's just because those ranges are, will produce interesting sounds but you're absolutely free to make the ranges whatever is relevant in your case. So we also have callbacks for each of these interface elements and I could have put these callbacks in the JavaScript file but here I've put them into the HTML file because I want just to group the user interface aspects over here. So um, we create a script in the HTML file right here and if someone selects carrier frequency, changes that, then we have a label on the interface and the label um, will show what value has been selected for carrier frequency. We do the same thing for modulation depth and for modulation frequency. Also, we tie these parameters into values that are used in for web audio. So the carrier frequency um, will be set to this carrier frequency from the interface. The modulator will, will have a gain value, which I'll um, talk about in a minute, and that's set to the modulation depth. And the modulator's frequency is set, of course, to modulation frequency. The last element on the interface is the start stop button. And so essentially, if the state is suspended, we resume it. If it, the, the state is active and we, the audio context is running, then when this button is clicked, we stop the sound by suspending the audio context. Last line here is of course essential which is that we need to point to the JavaScript file. Okay, so that's the HTML file. Where do we do the interesting things with sound? And that is in this JavaScript file. So you are definitely going to see it all now. Um, as in all of our examples, we need to define an audio context before anything can be done with the Web Audio API. So that is this first line here, context equals new audio context. Then how it works is we basically have an oscillator and that's the carrier and the frequency of that oscillator will be the sum of the carrier frequency offset, that's what its frequency would be without any modulation, and the modulator itself. So those two will need to be summed together. And the modulator has a modulation depth, which we apply using a gain. So we need some, a, uh, a constant value for the carrier frequency offset. Now we can change that value over time, but this is a constant source node. Constant source nodes are very useful when you need to add one value to another signal. So we have the line here, um, of we define a variable carrier frequency offset is a new constant source node 
where we define its offset, that's the value that it produces, as the carrier frequency value. Then we have the carrier, which is an oscillator. We set its frequency initially to zero, because it's going to be the sum of the carrier frequency offset and the modulator itself. And we have another oscillator for the modulator oscillator. There's no gain, no modulation depth at this point. Um, this oscillator will have its frequency set by the modulation frequency. Finally, we have the modulator itself, and that is just multiplying a gain by the oscillator for the modulator. So we need a modulation depth. So this is a gain node where the gain parameter is modulation depth dot value. Okay, <coughs> all the scheduled source nodes always need to be stored in the web audio API. Otherwise, they just don't do anything, don't produce any sound. So scheduled source nodes include oscillators, constant sources, and buffers. And we don't really deal with buffers here because we're looking at how to create the sound rather than work with stored sound. So um, we start the carrier, which is an oscillator, the modulator oscillator, another oscillator, and the carrier frequency offset, which is a constant source. Then the modulator oscillator has a gain applied, and that way we can apply the modulation depth to the, the modulation. So we know to connect modulator oscillator to um, the modulator. And we've already set the modulator um, modulator's gain to modulation frequency value. Uh, no, sorry, to modulation depth. By the way, whenever we change these parameters, things change appropriately. So if you look back at the um, HTML file, when the modulation depth changes, the modulator's gain value also changes with that. So, we then simply sum the modulator and the carrier frequency offset together to give the parameter for the carrier's frequency. That is doing this addition right here. And finally, the output which is the carrier, which has now been modulated, uh, routes to or connects to the destination to produce sound. So now I'm going to try something I haven't done before, which is switch from the microphone to the system sound and see if I can uh, demonstrate this to you. So before we do that, we're going to start the server so that we can run this on a web page. Ah, not sure if you heard that, but that was very loud. And I'm going to open the um, developer tools just so I can see if there's any bugs. Um, aha, let me fix. We don't need this signal functions. I used it while I was developing this. So let's get rid of that line. Let's reload. And no bugs. So now I'm going to switch over to the system sound and let's see if that works. Oh, I think, I think you did get system sound. But let's, let me turn off the mic. Uh, 
Okay, so you can see that this produces lots of interesting sounds. You can get siren sounds, you can get bird calls from this, um, you can get horns, uh, various types of uh, beeping sounds, um, use it to create robot effects, space effects, all sorts of things like that. And we may build on what was done here to produce some of those interesting sounds in future lecture videos. But